Welcome to the next chapter in the Quick and Dirty MassCom 101 lectures. I'm doing something a little different for the movie chapter because it's a it's a very major chapter in the course. So I'm going to split it into two. Uh, like Hollywood, I'm going to milk this for a sequel. Uh, part one, which you'll be hearing on this recording, will be the history of motion pictures. So let's begin. Uh, moving pictures are an optical illusion. It's something called the persistence of vision. You know, think about getting a box of Cracker Jacks where it has a, a, a little flip book where there are a lot of simple drawings of a clown laughing or a ballerina jumping, and each picture is just slightly different than the one before it and the one after it. If you riffle through those pictures very, very quickly, it creates the illusion of motion. And that, in simplified form, is what makes moving pictures possible. Thomas Edison uh, sort of invented the first motion picture camera, which he called the kinetoscope. Uh, Edison, by the late 1880s, had uh, some very brilliant research assistants who he put on his uh, more complex projects. His most brilliant research assistant was a gentleman named William Lurie Dixon. And certainly a lot of the day-to-day -day innovation came from Mr. Dixon. Now that said, Edison directed the project, he funded the project, uh, he was available for consultations. It should also be noted that right around the late 1880s, there were others who were also working on moving pictures. In France, the Lumiere brothers were doing some very important uh, early work. In England, William Fox Talbot was also working on his own moving picture machine. As for the Lumiere brothers, uh, they can be seen as the, oh, what would you call them? Uh, the, the, the inventors of the animated cartoon. You know, whenever we talk about photography, whether it be still photography or motion pictures, certainly France is right at the center of it. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, discussion over, well, what really was the first movie? You know, Thomas Edison had uh, documentary photographers uh, go out and photograph Buffalo Bill's Wild West show or, you know, what it looked like as you took a streetcar down uh, the main street of a big city. But I don't really call that sort of documentary footage a movie. You know, if you think about uh, what really is uh, the first, you know, fictional story told on film to entertain. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I would go to 1902 France with George Millet's Trip to the Moon, a very charming film. In the United States, the earliest places where people could see movies were called Nickelodeons. It was very inexpensive entertainment. You know, the idea of uh, a big movie palace where it's this beautiful, impressive building that looks like a big opera house. Well, that was still 20 years in the future. As a matter of fact, these early Nickelodeons, they were pretty humble uh, little, little storefront operations. Uh, it was five cents to get in. Uh, even in those days, that was pretty inexpensive entertainment. There were no concessions, no cup holders. You paid your nickel. You sat on a hard wooden bench. You saw maybe uh, uh, six uh, short, one reel films, and then you went home. There is a connection between early movie going and recent immigrants to the United States. Now, it, it is true for the U.S., and I assume for other countries as well, that something bad happens somewhere 
and you get a lot of immigrants from that place. Uh, for that reason, immigration tends to happen in waves. Well, in these years, in the uh, uh, right around the turn of the 20th century, there was quite a lot of immigration to America's East Coast from various places in Europe. And this is where the Nickelodeons began to spring up. And remember, we are talking about silent films, where if there were any English language words at all, it would be a few words on the screen uh, through what was called an intertitle. So there really was not a language barrier. So yes, recent immigrants were among uh, some of the most faithful customers of the Nickelodeons. Early production of motion pictures in the U.S. centered, not surprisingly, around Edison. And Edison was in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Add to that that New York was the unrivaled cultural capital of the United States at that time, and it was pretty predictable that early motion picture production would be around New York and New Jersey. The earliest big-time producers of films thought of themselves as film factories. Remember, these Nickelodeons are going through these hastily made short little films six at a time. So the film factories were in the business of creating these filmed amusements in bulk. They thought of themselves and they ran themselves as film factories. In 1910, the six largest uh, uh, East Coast producers of, of movies formed a cartel. And the, the reason for this cartel was so that the, the biggest producers of films wouldn't drive each other out of business. They would all play by the same rules and, and they would all ensure profits for each other, for themselves. But another uh, uh, major reason for forming the cartel was to try to get rid of any competition outside of the big six film factories. So among other things, that meant they were very hard on foreign movies coming into the United States, and they were also hard on American independent uh, filmmakers. By about 1912, uh, a critical mass of independent American filmmakers began to realize that uh, uh, the, the environment for doing business around New York and New Jersey had grown so hostile for them that it was probably a good idea to find a new place to make movies. So what this did for these independent filmmakers was it gave them uh, a, a way to just sort of think about what would be the perfect place to make movies. I mean, what sort of attributes would such a place have? Well, for one thing, early motion pictures were shot outdoors and on location. So if you could have a place that had mild weather year-round, well, gee, you could keep those cameras rolling and that would be uh, a competitive advantage. Second, we assume that our studios are going to be making a, a variety of films, and for that reason, we're going to need uh, a, a variety of, of backdrops. Let's say that this week our studio is making Sidewalks of New York. We don't really have to be in New York to shoot that film. We could just have an establishing shot of the New York skyline, and then after that, any cityscape will do. Next week, we're doing Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, we don't actually have to be on a farm in Kansas to shoot that. As a matter of fact, in the era that we're talking about, wheat was still being grown in the San Fernando Valley. You block out the hills and mountains in the background, and hey, you've got something that can pass for Kansas. The week after that, we're making Lawrence of Arabia. I guess you've probably caught on that we're not going to shoot this in the Arabian Desert. But in those days, 
if you went out uh, as far as uh, Lancaster or Palmdale, it was about as remote as the Arabian Desert. Uh, the week after that, we're going to shoot Heidi in the Swiss Alps. Well, if we have a big budget, maybe we'll make it to the Sierras, but more likely the San Gabriels, or as one film mogul um, in this era famously said, a rock is a rock, a tree is a tree, shoot in Griffith Park. Another reason, uh, another thing that the independent filmmakers were looking for in in a, a ideal place to make movies is that these are undercapitalized little companies that are going up against the big film factories. So they need to have a cost advantage. You know, you think about those big studio lots in Culver City and Hollywood and Burbank, and you think, oh my gosh, how much is that real estate worth now compared to how much did it cost when they uh, first bought it? Uh, an irony uh, uh, about, about this point was also labor cost. Um, you know, when, when the independent filmmakers were looking for a place with low labor costs, that was kind of a code term for a place where labor unions were weak to non-existent. Now that's ironic because today the Hollywood film industry is heavily unionized. There was a concern about legal harassment from the MPPC, the big six film factories on the East Coast. Uh, the MPPC had a robust legal department that uh, sued over all sorts of things, real and imagined. And the trouble with being a small independent company that is being sued by someone who is much bigger, much, uh, much wealthier than you, is that you can go broke just trying to uh, uh, defend yourself in court. So the, uh, the filmmakers wanted to have an international border that they could skip over if the legal situation ever got too hostile. And more than a hundred years ago, certainly distance from your tormentors mattered. So all of this brought the independent filmmakers to our part of the world. And I'd like to point out that the first Hollywood studio uh, was not actually in Hollywood. Uh, the, the, the first studio was in what we would recognize today as Echo Park. Please note that the region that they came to was not the big city that you know of today. Uh, please note this, this picture here. This is the corner of Prospect, uh, Prospect Avenue, later be known as Hollywood Boulevard, and Coinga, uh, maybe about a decade or a decade plus before the uh, independent filmmakers uh, arrived. Hollywood was uh, a, a township known as the Coinga Valley. In the American era, it had been founded by Kansas prohibitionists, a, a group of people who were so straight-laced that they did not uh, uh, allow the serving of alcohol within their township. Pretty soon, uh, the film colony, as they were called, uh, moved to around what was called Gower Gulch, which would be near uh, Gower and Sunset Boulevard today, where there is a rather garish mini mall that is called Gower Gulch. And the Coinga Valley would uh, be annexed to the city of Los Angeles and would be known as Hollywood. I think that the independent filmmakers, once they began to become established in Hollywood, they had a couple of good ideas, and they had one stroke of good luck that within about 10 years made them the dominant forces in the American movie industry. Now, for example, the film factories were uh, competing on quantity. The film factories were making many simple, short, 
<laughs> one take uh, uh, films. The Hollywood studios realized they couldn't compete on quantity of films made. So instead, they competed on quality. They made longer films. They made more carefully shot, more carefully scripted, more carefully thought out films. So that was a good idea. An even better idea from a commercial standpoint that the Hollywood independents had was that the film factories, and this is going to sound a little unbelievable, the film factories tried to keep their performers as anonymous as possible. You say, well, why would you do that? Well, remember, they're film factories, and they saw the actors as labor. You know, the, the, the thought was, was that, gee, if these performers start getting um, uh, famous, you know, they'll, they'll ask for more money, they'll be hard to handle, and, and, and so forth. Well, the Hollywood studios saw it exactly the other way. They had uh, very well-funded publicity departments that very consciously helped to make the leading performers into stars. Uh, the woman that you are seeing on this slide is Clara Bow, uh, the first love goddess of the Hollywood screen. And at the height of her fame, uh, she had an entire staff answering her fan mail. And within about a decade, there was a surprising reversal of fortune where the Hollywood filmmakers were now the leaders in the industry. Now, I mentioned to you that, the, that the, these Hollywood filmmakers had two good ideas and one good piece of luck. Well, the good piece of luck was that they needed an affluent society. They, they, they needed a, a, an America that was more wealthy than it had ever been uh, for this strategy to work. Because after all, if you're making more, more carefully scripted films, longer films, uh, you're, you're building people up into stars and they're, they're starting to demand star type paychecks. You know, all of that is going to drive up the cost of each film so that the old Nickelodeon model, you know, no longer makes economic sense. Well, the good piece of luck that the Hollywood studios had is that their strategy is leaning right into the roaring 20s, a time of unprecedented wealth, of unprecedented affluence uh, in, in the United States. So yes, ticket prices went up. Uh, in some cities, by the mid-1920s, tickets cost as much as a dollar. I mean, I know that still doesn't sound like much, but compare it with, you know, not so many years earlier, it had only been five cents. So the price went up 20-fold. That would be like the difference today between $10 and $200. Now, if you're going to ask people to pay significant money to go to the movies, well, the, the little Nickelodeon storefront with the hard wooden benches, that's not going to cut it anymore. So the 1920s were also the era of the grand movie palaces. These are, uh, the ones that remain are, 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 are truly impressive. Uh, the picture here is of the Orpheum Theater, 842 South Broadway, uh, downtown Los Angeles. And by the way, this is the way the Orpheum looks today. It was renovated about 20 years ago, and uh, they, they do a lot of live stuff there. They do um, a lot of location shoots. You know, if you're looking at a movie where there's a scene in an opera house or something like that, it may have been shot in, in the Orpheum. Now, for the movie industry, one of the great things about the movie palaces was, you know, not every film, not even every big budget film is great. But if people dressed up like ladies and gentlemen and they went out to a fancy place like the Orpheum, well, even if the movie wasn't so great, the theater itself was part of the attraction. 
silent movies uh, are an art form that are considerably different than talking films. You know, I don't think you really realize that until you go to see a silent film in a movie palace and there is at least an organist, if not a small orchestra, there to accompany uh, the film live. Only then do you realize, ooh, this is a truly different art form. As for talking pictures, they were feasible technologically by 1919. And so you would think that the Hollywood uh, studios, which had you know really uh, been innovators, that you would think that they would jump on this exciting new technology right away. And if that's what you think, eh, you'd be wrong. Well, it took the Hollywood studios uh, seven long years to getting around to making the first talking picture. So if you're, uh, if you're seeing this in class, uh, I would be interested in having you use the, uh, uh, the chat feature to speculate on, on why the Hollywood studios waited seven long years to make the first talkie. And while you're speculating about that, why, why do you think that one of the most struggling studios in town, little um, money-losing Warner Brothers, was the first to go big with talking pictures? I mean, if Don Juan and the jazz singer had failed, we would have never heard of Warner Brothers. So... Why did they go first and not, uh, oh, Paramount or, you know, one of the, uh, the studios that, that could have easily afforded to make a flop? The transition from silent films to talking films really changed a lot of careers. It made careers for some, uh, destroyed careers for others. Now, one of the temporary changes that, uh, that, that talking pictures caused was that the early talkie equipment was very big, heavy, cumbersome, hard to move, yet delicate. And so it meant that uh, production had to come inside to gigantic sound stages for about the first 10 years of talkies. I mean, think about you know, the, the classic Judy Garland, Wizard of Oz. I mean, you can see that when she's skipping through the cornfields and, and uh, uh, going to the land of Oz, you know, clearly that's all in this huge airplane hangar-sized studio. Uh, directing a silent film is a little different than directing a talking film. I mean, for one thing, you're not uh, directing uh, speech. But for another thing, to really tell the story without sound, you know, you have to have uh, gestures and facial expressions, uh, you know, do a lot of the storytelling. But when you move to talking pictures, you need to tone those things down a little bit. And, and some directors, including uh, D.W. Griffith, maybe one of America's most famous silent directors, just never really quite got the hang of it. Now, for comedians, uh, talking pictures were a new opportunity because in silent movies, uh, comedy had to be physical. I mean, there, there just wasn't anything else than funny falls or pie fights or what have you. And you could still do physical comedy and talkies. I mean, think of the Three Stooges. They came along during the talking era, and they were, you know, very physical in their comedy. But note that what talking movies did was they created a place for the wisecracking, joke-telling comedian. Now, also note that for a performer to be in silent movies, they had to know enough English to be able to take direction. But nobody knew what they sounded like when they opened their mouths. For some performers, uh, their talking debut was a terrifying thing. You know, there were some performers like Clara Bow who 
you know, was born in the United States, but simply had an unfortunate voice. You know, the great love goddess of the screen, uh, she apparently had a, uh, uh, a high-pitched, screechy voice, and she spoke with kind of a, uh, a, a lower-class uh, um, Hell's Kitchen, New York sort of accent. Critics said that when uh, Clara Bow finally got to speak, she sounded more like olive oil from the Popeye cartoons. Well, another situation, another problem that actors had was, you know, what if they were an import from Germany or Sweden or, or Spain or someplace? And yes, they could speak passable English on a daily basis, but they sure couldn't sound like, uh, you know, uh, a, an American police officer or uh, a Kansas farmer or something like that. And so uh, hasty accent reduction lessons were the order of the day. We're now moving to the post-World War II era. As you are probably aware, uh, the United States and Soviet Union uh, were on the same side in the, uh, the Second World War. But after the Second World War, uh, with the partition of Germany and, and other matters, uh, eventually becoming a, a nuclear rivalry, uh, eventually becoming what we call the Cold War, uh, our rivalry with the Soviet Union became pretty intense, and that touched the movie industry. In 1947, there was a committee in the House called HUAC, that, that was an acronym, H-U-A-C, House Un-American Activities Committee. In 1947, HUAC held hearings on communist influences in Hollywood. There was a great concern, given the, uh, the, the strong anti-communist attitudes of the day, that perhaps uh, uh, communist sympathizer writers, actors, directors, and others were somehow infiltrating our movies and getting un-American messages out to the public. The Hollywood Ten were an early group of, of Hollywood figures who refused to testify uh, before HUAC. didn't necessarily mean they were communists, it just meant that they strongly disagreed with what HUAC was doing. The Hollywood Ten uh, were briefly jailed, but probably the more uh, damaging thing to them was uh, for the better part of a decade, they were blacklisted. That meant they couldn't get any more work uh, in the movie industry, in the American movie industry. By 1953, remember this started in 1947, so by 1953, uh, the blacklist in Hollywood had grown to over 300. And all throughout this period, screenwriters were disproportionately uh, represented. The blacklist began to crumble in 1960. Uh, Dalton Trumpo was an Academy Award winning screenwriter who, it is believed, uh, submitted scripts uh, through an assumed name in the 1950s. And finally, in 1960, he was once again able to sell scripts uh, as himself, as Dalton Trumpo. The 1950s were a, a difficult time for the movie industry for another reason that had, you know, nothing to do with communism. It was a time when part of the audience uh, stopped going to movie theaters, or at least not going quite so often. You know, I, I think this figure is uh, 
a little more dramatic than it really was. I mean, when you think about what was happening in the U.S. in 1946, the Second World War was over. So you had the GIs coming home and reconnecting with their social lives. So maybe 1946 was an unusually big year for movie going. But still, by 1953, movie audiences dropping by almost half. I would imagine to studio executives looking at that in the early 50s, you know, they, they were probably concerned that it was more than just a slump, that maybe it was a, a death spiral. Well, the Hollywood studios tr tried to figure out what can we continue to give people in movie theaters that they can't get on television. So this is when the first 3D movies were, were made, and especially in the 50s, 3D was a was a real gimmick. You know, people got the, the geeky cardboard glasses, and there were scenes that were contrived to take advantage of the 3D technology, people pointing spears at the camera, and, you know, stuff like that. Larger format film, that was a, that was an interesting uh, uh, idea. Uh, if you've ever been to the Cinerama Dome uh, in Hollywood, uh, near Sunset and Vine, what now anchors the, the arc light there. The Cinerama Dome was originally just a single screen theater that opened in 1964. And Cinerama refers to an ultra-wide um, uh, projection technology that was briefly tried. And as a kid, I can remember going to the Cinerama Dome to see how the West was won, an epic Western, uh, in Cinerama. And it was fascinating because it called for a curved screen and three projectors running different pieces of the movie at the same time. The idea was, was that the audience would be somewhat surrounded by the action. Well, Cinerama was maybe a little too complex for your neighborhood theater, and so it died out pretty quickly. Now, what was a more reliable way of bringing people back to the movie theater was to simply make movies in color. You know, there was not a whole lot of color on television until, oh, I would say the mid to late 1960s. By the 1970s, the single-screen movie houses began to be replaced by multiplexes. And when we get into part two, I have just one more slide, and then it'll be the end of part one of this movie chapter. Uh, by the 1970s, 1980s, new theaters being built would have multiple screens, and that would allow different segments of the movie-going audience to come out on the same evening. Also, by the 1970s, we see the beginning of the blockbuster era. And what I mean by that is not, you know, like the, uh, like the movie or the uh, video rental chain. I don't mean that kind of blockbuster. What blockbuster means here is a movie that has the best of everything. You know, the the, the most beloved, highest paid, most bankable stars, a big name director, big time special effects, uh, huge advertising and marketing of the film. That's a blockbuster. The blockbuster formula, I think, was first demonstrated with uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, Jaws in 1975. It was a big, crowd-pleasing summer film. And, you know, as you know, summer is the height of the movie-going season. And in the years ever since, the studios have, and you're probably well aware of this, the studios have uh, uh, lined up a whole roster of big-budget summer movies. Uh, I I believe that Avatar has been beaten at the box office in recent years, uh, but here's a here's a statistic that, uh, that that I'll end with because it's really kind of amazing. All right, what do you think is 
the movie that has sold the most tickets at American movie theaters ever. I know you're thinking Batman, you're thinking Avatar, you're thinking, you know, all, all, all sorts of Star Wars. No. It is still the creaky old 1939 Gone with the Wind. Well, the last thing I want to say in uh, part one of, of the movie chapter is that the the movie industry entered a new phase in the 1990s as home video release uh, became as important as releasing the movie in theaters. Uh, I, I remember years ago giving a media note to my classes about how Walmart and Target and uh, other places where uh, VHSs and then later DVDs were sold were becoming as important um, to the Hollywood studios uh, as the movie theater chains were. Well, that brings us to the end of part one of the movie industry chapter.